bringing that stuff here and, and setting up the room and helping all the way through the past um, weeks. Today we really are going to get into this. We're going to start out with the, like a little introductory lecture. M much of this will be familiar to you if you've heard my talks before. Um, I'm going to be the first in a row of, of lectures, so I'm going to pro try to provide a little bit of an overview and just show you, basically this is a, this is a tour to the zoo. And I'm going to show you some animals and you won't understand them, you won't quite know what they are. And then um, I leave it to the lecturer number one, who's Christoph Uhlemann over here. He's going to um, describe to you these, these um, differential geometry um, animals a little bit and um, guide you through, through that case and then see um, what, uh, what, uh, can, what you can do with, with this in respect, um, with respect to holography. And there will be exercises in the afternoon, so let me, let me show you the, the structure. Um, this is today, and um, after, after my lecture we have a little coffee break. Then um, we have the lecture by Christoph. Uh, we changed the title to ADS-CFT in a nutshell. String theory and differential <coughs> geometry and ADS-CFT in, in, in three one-hour lectures seemed a little ambitious, so this is, um, this is a slightly more um, moderate approach, but I think you will get more out of this. Um, then there's a break at um, 11.15 to 11.30, and at 11.30 um, to 12.30 is this, um, Christoph's uh, uh, second lecture, which is our third lecture in total. And then we have a lunch break. Let me briefly say over the lunch break, my idea would be to just go over to the Ferguson Center or the Quad or wherever we can steal some barbecue <laughs> and, um, and get something quickly. So everyone, in principle it's every man for themselves because I won't try to keep a herd of 20 people together in this, right? So, but then it's crucial to be back here at the front debates at 12.30 because security will be probably pretty like, adamant about um, re like enforcing access to the buildings. And so we, we should better reunite at 12.30 at that, front, at that, that door. Two? Uh, sorry, at, at 2. Uh, yeah, thank you. At 2, we should be back there. So I'll announce it again, but so you have a plan of the, of the day. You can always call me um, in emergencies, but it's the phone of shame, you remember that. So um, exercises, the idea is to, um, Christoph has a nice set of exercises, which, be, which he gave me yesterday at 11, and made me do it. Um, so uh, I, I think it's really good, good stuff that he came up with. And um, it's also a lot of work, that's why you have three hours or so. And uh, let's see how fast we get through this, and, um, and then we can, can work, um, just present, everybody would be um, asked to, to present the solution that they found. Not everybody, but you know, you, you're invited to present a solution so that it's not just Christoph putting something on the board that nobody's interested in. Right? So if you have a solution, you should fight for it and defend it and say why you think that's, this, that's the right thing for these exercises. So this is, this is a rough sketch and it can be shorter. Like if you're faster solving those exercises, we can totally do this earlier. Right? We can call it, a, call it a day when we're exhausted. Um, good, on Sunday basically it's the same structure as far as the times go and we will have Christoph's final lecture but then also Christian Jensen from Stony Brook will come in um, for his two lectures on fluids and black holes and then there will be uh, later at night there will be drinks and pizza at the Mellow Rush room, Mushroom so at downtown if you guys know where that is over there good that's tomorrow today and tomorrow so let me talk about concepts of holography in my first first part and then about example applications of holography the idea is to give you a little bit of an overview of what, what Christoph will then be uh, filling with details. Again, here's the picture of an optical hologram. The key point to note here is that you have higher dimensional information, in this case three-dimensional visual image, that is stored in a two-dimensional surface. So you store three-dimensional information on this two-dimensional surface. And that's essentially, that, that's at the heart of the concept of holography. And we learn, we're learning that this is not only true in, optical, in the optical context, but it's also true for gravitational and uh, quantum field theories. So to give you again this 
um, job description of, of, of an applied holographer who applies this concept, such, such as our, our working group here. What you often do is you construct the string theory model and um, the string theory uh, model has then applications to, for example, heavy ion collisions, which are conducted at the RIC heavy ion um, collider in Brookhaven and, and the LHC in CERN. And heavy ion collisions look something like this. You have two Lorentz contracted heavy nuclei. That's your initial state. They are approaching each other with, with uh, a lot of uh, momentum, each one. Um, and then, then they, uh, when they hit, the state forms that is some sort of pre-equilibrium that is then transferred into what we believe is a quark-gluon plasma, a state of matter that behaves like a fluid as opposed to a gas, what people thought in, in the very early days. So that was a big uh, surprise around 2003, 2005. And then after that, patterns freeze out. So you have patternization and freeze out. You can also apply these, these, um, these string theory models that applied holographers construct to ultra-cold gas clouds or condensed matter physics examples like, such as um, strange metals or, or the Cupert um, high temperature superconductors. Also, this is all connected to, to black hole physics in the sense that you work with black holes on the gravity side. And um, we have tools which we use, and that's mainly quantum field theory and string theory. Well, and I should also say gravity, so kind of trunca consistent truncations of string theory. <coughs> Numerical code needs to be written in order to solve Einstein's equations in the presence of matter. That's usually what, uh, what the numerical code is uh, good for. But you also want to convince yourself that you're, that you're doing something reasonable and, and what, what your numerical answers are telling you. Really. So you need, to some, uh, you need to go to limits where you can work with pencil and paper. Or sometimes you just have to work on something fun fundamentally new. So when you have your quantum field theory class, you, you learn all these concepts, like how to compute correlation functions, what is the, a good definition of a correlation function, how does thermal quantum field theory work, and those are all concepts that we need to learn or relearn in this kind of context, in this new kind of context of holography. Good. So let me just tell you that um, these, these slides will be online, so um, I will get them to you as soon as possible. So if, I mean, if this, um, and then the, the next two lecturers will, will um, keep uh, blackboard notes, and but they will also provide those notes, right? Um, and so, so if you if you like writing, then you you're welcome to write, and if it helps you to to jot things down, but um, you should not be rushed. So you you will be provided those those lecture notes. It's, how legible they, they are, that's, that's another thing, like they're handwritten, right? So, so you might want to at least write down a few, a few reminders so, so as to, to remember what, what you thought at the time, what, what was written on the board. Good, so that as a, as a side note, right? Um, but to, let me get back to holography. What's the basic idea of applied holography? So we start out with uh, some hard problem that is too, too difficult to solve in a given quantum field theory, let's take QCD for example, and let's model this um, with a, one of the set string, string uh, models. You come to a still hard problem in a similar theory, similar to the theory that you actually want to uh, work in. Um, and then, then you, you translate this hard problem to a simpler problem using the gauge gravity correspondence. So when I, when I say model here, um, I should say this, this, this can, be, can be an effective description, such as hydrodynamics, which is what we hear, what we hear about in the second part of the lectures tomorrow. Um, or it can be, um, it can be a, a direct quantum field theory description. In, in, in some ways, you look at a simpler quantum field theory that shares some properties with QCD, for example, such, such as n equals uh, 4 super young Mills theory, as an example, that shares some properties of QCD. QCD. So that's this other, this other theory, just as an example there. And then you translate that still hard problem there using gauge gravity to a, into a gravity calculation that you can actually do. Now, as, as I pointed out earlier um, in, in earlier talks to most of you, or conversations also, um, 
we don't know the exact dual of QCD, so that makes it hard. That's why we need to take this detour. Otherwise, I could just take the shortcut and, and say, I'll translate QCD into its gravity dual and then do calculations in this gravity dual. But unfortunately, it's not known yet. So what we learned from that is that holography is a good, um, it is a good tool to make uh, predictions which are very, very universal. You have to ask the right questions in order to get in order to get meaningful answers from holography. So that's that's another way of saying this. <coughs> Qualitative or universal answers, that's what you can expect. So let me just introduce these words that, that are going to be detailed further in the in the coming lectures. We have a big gauge gravity correspondence uh, which is based on holo on the holographic principle. So let me just, what's the, what's the hierarchy of things? Gauge gravity to me is a little more general than, than ADS-CFT. Holography or the holographic principle is yet more general. So everything is basically uh, rooted in the holographic principle that we, that we explained briefly. Um, but let's, so looking at this picture earlier on, right? So this picture was a visual incarnation or a realization of the holographic principle. Um, let's look at this artist's rendition of a black hole, just to have a picture in mind. In black holes, a similar effect is, is, is seen. You have a, a horizon symbolized here by the surface in a black hole, um, which is basically a, a causal boundary. So once information falls in, classically it cannot get out, or excitations fall in, they cannot get out. There's, um, there's only one, it's a one-way road into the black hole. Now, uh, that's the surface, and, and the people like Hawking and, and Beckenstein and friends, they found that, um, that the surface uh, can store, should be seen as storing information. And all the information uh, that you need in order to describe this higher dimensional um, object, the black hole, the interior, uh, the exterior space-time of the black hole. So you don't need to know the full space, you just need to know about the surface of the black hole. So basically that, that would imply that, that um, a lower dimensional surface can store all the information that also is stored in this higher dimensional gravitational theory. So this is already um, one way of, of formulating um, a gauge gravity correspondence. If you, if you think a little further, how is this formula um, motivated? Well, information, storing information is basically information um, Desmond showed us in, in, a, in a seminar talk is somewhat inversely related to, to, to entropy. Entropy is our ignorance about the system or measures, measures our ignorance about the system. And um, the entropy of a certain, certain volume, like this one, grows with the, not with the volume, that's, su that's the sort of surprising part here, but with the surface area of that, of that object. And um, so, the, the way you find it, basically you, you try to do quantum field theory in a certain volume and um, Toft actually pointed this out. Um, you try to f um, fit all possible quantum uh, field theoretically allowed um, states in there. But then you, you find that, uh, that you, would, you would also have um, to think about the fact that if you fit two highly energetic modes in there into this volume, then the whole thing would collapse into a black hole. So basically you have to keep that in mind and only and, and put some restrictions on, restrictions on the number of states that you fit into your volume. And this kind of idea then leads to, to this restriction that your, the number of modes that you can fit into a volume cannot grow with the volume but it has to grow with um, the surface area. So this is in, in, in flowery words, um, something that can actually be quantified and, and put down into formula. But just to give you the picture here. So string theory gives a, a particular real, realization of this holographic principle in the form of ADS-CFT correspondence. What's the ADS side? Well, ADS means un is a net short, it's an abbreviation for anti visitor space. And it's a type 2B supergravity theory that lives in this 4 plus 1 dimensional anti visitor space. That's, a, that's, that's on one side, that's the gravity side of the correspondence. And then on the gauge side, you have this n equal 4 super Mills theory in 3 plus 1 dimensions, which is, is conformal field theory, hence CFT. 
super young males, super means it's a super symmetric uh, theory. So in, in fact, this um, theory has super conformal um, symmetries. And there will be more, more on these, these uh, ideas later on. But this is all we need to know for now. This is a, a specific realization of the holographic principle in string theory. And uh, I should also say this is conjecture. So we don't, we don't know a, a mathematically sound proof for this. But we have a lot of evidence and there's, there's a very strong line of argument, I would say, that, that tells us that these, these theories should be the same. Good. That was a lot of talking about the holographic principle in, in a lot of words. Let me try to get um, through this fairly quickly and um, tell you this, where, where, this, where this idea comes from. So just to give you at least a little bit of, a, of an idea where, where in string theory this, this specific example of ADS-CFT comes from. So this, this, I'm talking about this particular realization of topography principle now. That, that's what I refer to as ADS-CFT. So this comes from um, a stack of D3 brains that are coincident, so they, they are actually lying on top of each other. So this, this is just my, I'm just failing to, to draw it the right way, so these are actually coincident. They live in 10 dimensions. D3 brains are four dimensional objects. You count the spatial number of, of, of directions, so they stretch in three spatial directions plus the time direction. They are coincident, and they are objects that, just like strings, are ingredients in string theory, so to say. They are dynamical objects in string theory. They satisfy dynamical equations. Good. Now you have two ways in string theory to look at these. One, one way of describing the stack here is you look at it um, as a four-dimensional world volume theory on this stack of D3 brains. So you're, you're looking at basically an effective field theory description of the um, excitations near, this, near, the, near the brains here, near the stack of brains. You're trying to describe these excitations that live on there which are actually open string excitations, if you want to know that. Um, you try to describe them in an effective theory. And that's, that's, going, that's, that's going to be your any before super angles theory. That's our gauge theory side. And then you have another way of looking at the stack. You can just say in, in, in gravity, um, any, any object that carries mass or energy, and these, these, these objects carry, these brains, these three brains carry energy and mass. Any such object curves the space around them, or around it. So they, they are heavy objects, and you can try a gravitational description. And then you um, basically come up with this description of the near um, horizon geometry of this, this stack of brains. So you, again, go near the brains, but have a gravitational description. And um, you find that the near horizon geometry there uh, in that limit is an ADS5 process 5 geometry. So that gives you, for example, type 2b supergravity with a 5 volt flux through, the, um, through this 5 sphere, um, living in this ADS5 process 5 space. Remember, string theory lives in 10 dimensions, right? At least these examples. So that's our gravity theory size. And this is really just for you to have heard these terms. And um, I hope they, uh, at least some of them will be filled over the, the next couple of days with, with content. But it's, this is just pure ex learning by exposure, knowing like this thing is there. But you are all, always welcome to ask questions also. So stop me if you, if you want to learn about something in particular. I know. So why is it called the three brains? Uh, oh, it's, there's uh, three spatial directions, and there's one time direction. And it's a four-dimensional object by that. So it's a directly three brains, so what these objects are, are actually hypersurfaces in the ten-dimensional space-time, um, and these hypersurfaces determine the points where open strings can end. So basically, you can think of them as an ensemble or a collection of string ends. But that, if you look at it, um, satisfies dynamical equations itself. So you call it a dynamical object in itself. That's, the, I think, the best description I can give you right now. Other questions? Um, why not type 2A? Ah, you can, you can um, try playing games with other, other um, string theories. Yeah, so Andres is pointing out there are different
types of strict theories. So let me take the easy way out and say Malasena uh, sat down and, and studied this, decided to study it in type 2b, supergravity, and brains in type 2b. B, so that's why AACFD is formulated here. There have been other, other the people looked also at other um, string theory realizations or, or string theory formulations, I should say. And, and so, so other people look at so-called M2 brains. And, um, and, and so, so there are the there's the, is the possibility to look at basically the same, same principle, the same, same similar kind of objects, but in, in another description, in another formulation. So that works. That, that is indeed possible. And you would learn new, new things from that. Uh, am I reading too literally on the picture when you have closed strings on the gravity side compared to the open like No, that's, that's a very good observation. So, indeed, this is a duality um, between a correspondence between open strings on the, on the gauge side and, and closed strings on the gravity side. And you would want, so, you would want gravity to have closed strings because the graviton is a, is a, is a closed string excitation. So that's as, as good a, a, of an explanation that I can give right now. Um, on the gauge theory side, I have a harder time. I can tell you about um, st open strings that end on a, multiple, uh, on, on a bunch of coincident brains, and each string endpoint carries a charge. If that car charge can, can potentially sit on each of either of these brain, brains, then you get a gauge symmetry that takes you from one takes that charged end of the string from one brain to another. That's a gauge symmetry. So you, that's kind of why you have a gauge theory versus um, gravity relation between open and closed strings on the other side. Could you maybe later after this session give a good reference for just to show the crash course to the string theory? Yeah, sure. Like it's that's, that's like, beyond yeah. this. I don't there are a few. So I didn't want to really dwell on That's this, fine. just, yeah. just again, this is just uh, learning by exposure. And I will rush through the rest of this. Um, because we, um, on the schedule, it's this, this session ends at 10, right? Yeah. Good. I'll have to go through 20 more slides until then. So let's move on. Let me just say that what basically what our job is at, as applied holographers, we add or change geometric objects in string theory or in the gravity theory, normally on this side of, of the game. And then we, we um, derive what is the corresponding field theory object. And then we can, we can make calculations that tell us about those field theory objects. So for example, you can um, have a Schwarzschild radius. So you, put a, you make these brains so heavy that they develop a Schwarzschild radius. And um, then in that case, uh, that radius will correspond to temperature on the field theory side, you, so you, your inequal force of the theory will live in a state that, that has finite temperature, so to say. It's, it turns into a thermal point of view. Theory. So equilibrium states can be described in this way. You, again, this is basically a repetition of what is the correspondence doing. You have a strongly coupled point of view theory on the left-hand side, and it corresponds to a weakly curved gravitational theory on the, on the other side. So by the color coding, you see that the gravitational um, theory fills this whole bulk. And this is an, an, an image of ADS in a, in a particular coordinate system, in a particular signature. You, you can write, draw ADS like this. And uh, on the boundary of this, this anti-visitor space, of this ADS space, there lives, that's where the quantum field theory is. You have a radial coordinate that takes you from the origin of anti space to the boundary. Now that radial coordinate has a meaning in the quantum field theory. This radial coordinate on the quantum field theory side corresponds to a renormalization scale, energy, energy scale. So if you have a gravitational excitation that is in here at the origin, r equals zero, that has a different energy, a different meaning, a different impact on your quantum field theory than an excitation that lives here. Those are low energy infrared excitations and those um, are UV excitations or UV modes. So that hopefully also will, will build a concept in your mind that will then be filled with more formal, um, uh, formal uh, background in, in the following lectures. Now, 
let me just add, so do what I said on the previous slide, add some geometrical features on the gravity side. So I just added, if you watch this, this carefully, um, I added two things. I added, I added a, um, the charge and I basically I also added the black hole here, right? So these are charges sitting on the black hole horizon and, they, um, and I also added this black hole. So that tells me on the gravity side I have a horizon which we know corresponds to a Hawking temperature then, and uh, we have charges sitting on that horizon. And on the field theory side, that those two features correspond to quantum field theory at finite temperature, so you get the Hawking temperature corresponding to the QFT temperature, and um, the charges of the black hole corresponding to conserved charges of the quantum field theory within the correct quantum field theory. So you get a conserved current also, a neutral current, with this, along with this, this charge. Now, let me give an example. This is also an example that um, Roshan sh um, showed in his um, talk yesterday, um, leading a little bit up to this, this series of lectures. We uh, have on the field theory side now an N equal 4 super Young's theory. That means um, this, this quantum field theory has four supercharges, so four supersymmetries, so to say, um, at non zero temperature and at a non zero charge. And um, this corresponds to a metric in gauge field um, which defines a weissmann lossmann black ring on this, on this right hand side. So let's look at this in, in some more detail. So you should actually, the way we think is we start on the right hand side and then interpret things on the left hand side. Right? So, um, but you could also read it like I want to model a theory like this so if you ask the question what kind of, what kind of um, gravity theory do, do I have to build for that? Or you can ask the question, what does string theory has to off, uh, have to offer in order to, uh, to make, realize this kind of correspondence that I want? Good, so let's look at this metric real quick. So we have uh, an R squared over L squared. L is the radius um, of the anti-de-zitter space and of this S5. You remember there's an S5 there, but let's forget about the S5 for now. Let's only do it deal with the ADS5. And that's the metric that I wrote down here. It's an, uh, asymptotically, it's an ADS5 metric. So if I look near the boundary, at large R, then this is, you can convince yourself, it's actually, I know that's one of the exercises that Christoph has in, in, in mind um, and in stock for you. Um, you can show that this is actually asymptotically anti the zitter still. So that's why the correspondence still holds. But you've deformed the space internally by putting a black hole there, and, and that's described a charged black hole indeed. And that's described by this black blackening factor f in front of the dt squared, the metric, the time-like metric component. And um, this f also um, appears in the dr squared. So this blackening factor is written out here, and it is basically just uh, telling you that the, your horizon location depends on the mass and the charge of the black hole. Why? Well. At the horizon, this fr has to zero. The time direction, the time like uh, the GTT, the metric and time direction, basically vanishes. That's the that's the defining condition for the horizon for this surface, this horizon, the event horizon of the black hole. Now this is an example, and it comes since there's charges, they need to be field lines, and um, that's described by a gauge field in this particular way, where you have a leading order term, which is a constant, and then you have a subleading order term, which is suppressed by powers of 1 over r squared. And uh, we can actually relate this, all these features on the right hand side, or to these gravity features, to these features on the left hand side as promised. <coughs> the um, Hawking temperature, or the temperature of the quantum field theory, which are the same thing, which are identified with each other. Um, this quantum field theory temperature, it can be computed by, the, um, by means of the horizon radius and this, uh, the derivative of the blackening factor. And then this is actually something you will also do in the exercises, so I refer you to, to Christoph's uh, Christos exercises here. And you can also relate this charge Q, which I talked about, which we want in this field theory, you can relate that to this, this Q, the charge of the black hole. So this little Q is actually the conserved charge. I, this, is a, this is actually a type of this should be. In any case, 
So, so you can also identify this leading order term that appears on the right hand side in the chemical, uh, sorry, in the in the AT component of the of the gauge potential. And that leading order co uh, component I already wrote in a suggestive way it is actually a chemical potential. That's why it's called mu. And this it's related to to the charge Q in this particular way. So this is a pattern that you will see recurring. You see here already something that, that is, is pretty deep in, in, in holography. You see something like an operator vacuum expectation value here because a charge is the vacuum expectation value of the time component of the, of the current, right? Is that, is that a familiar concept? So if you look at the op, um, expectation value of JT, JT being the time component of a, of a conserved current, a current that, con that um, satisfies this conservation equation, um, then you interpret JT as the charge rho. And we know the charge rho is thermodynamically dual to the chemical potential, and and what the chemical potential actually is 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 the source for the charge, right? That's that's one way of of, um, of looking at this so quantum field theoretically. So here there appears the source for this this operator, um, which which is appearing here as a VEF. So so basically, did I write this? Um, let's write it. This. So what that is telling us, that equation over there, is that AT is actually source um, plus some wef of the operator, and then there's some power of, of R with some number. Here. So that's and plus other contributions. So this is this is at the heart of, of holography too, um, and and it's it can be put into a general form, namely if I look at this diagram of my cartoon of anti space again, and then I zoom in on the near boundary region, so I look at this, this region near the boundary, then I can do an expansion because R will be large there, it will be infinite at the boundary, right? This is our radial coordinate, it will be infinite at the boundary. So let's expand in inverse powers of R that takes us close to the boundary. And then let's look at this gravity field. Let me just call it phi. It can be any kind of gravity field. And one of the excitations, the metric excitations that Roshan showed us yesterday, or anything else. Like it can be also a scalar, massless scalar, in, 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 in this, living in this gravitational theory in anti space. So on the field theory side, we know a field quantum field theory has operators. You can define it that way, right? As operators, those operators have all the vacuum expectation values. You can compute two point functions, three point functions, n point functions of those operators if you want. And those operators are sourced by sources in the quantum field theory. So, to give you the relation between these two quantities, you need to look at this near horizon expansion, expansion in powers of 1 over r. And now we can identify the leading order term with the source, that's what the holography tells us. That's the diction here. That's the mathematical map that is behind gauge gravity correspondence, or in this particular case, an ADSC um, example. And um, there will be subleading terms. Let's pick this one. Um, in this case, it's an example. This, this subleading term is um, the vacuum expectation value of the operator which corresponds to this field phi. You can also say this operator O, which is part of the quantum field theory living on the boundary, it's sourced by the, f by the bulk field phi. Or to be more precise, it's actually sourced by the, by the boundary value of the bulk field phi, namely by what I call here phi zero. Good, so that's a lot of things to take in. And another caveat here, so it's not always the leading Order here, so that's something to be careful about. But uh, that's also an exercise that, uh, luckily, um, Christoph has in his in his uh, lectures or in his exercise sheets. 
Good. So let me give you just a, an example in terms of, of what I talked about, namely A mu over here, right? I talked about the time component, but you can also look at the, the other components. A mu, a gauge field in the bulk, living, living in here, can be expanded near the, um, near the boundary. Um, and the leading term will correspond to a source. It's called it A mu zero. Um, and what, what is it sourcing? Well, it's sourcing a, um, a current, okay. namely the current that, 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 that contains this, this conserved charge here. So this, this current, J. That's what my JMU is. And um, what appears in the subleading term is going to be the vacuum expectation um, value of that current. And now this, this actually relates to the previous slide that, that I showed you, because if you, if you look at this, um, the form of, of this here, and you compare it to the form of the that we had previously, we had AT was, I can actually go back to the slide. Um, we had this form here, AT equal mu minus Q over L to the R squared. So this is exactly reflecting that, that form, right? Source and then vacuum expectation value of the JT, of the op operator. Good, okay. Now let me just rush through some examples. And again, so this will be quick. Um, don't, don't be scared, but also just please stop me and ask questions when you, when you have some, something in mind. One example application for, for this ADSCFT correspondence, this set of tools, is uh, to describe holographic superconductors. Well, what is that? They're superconductors that we think are governed by strongly correlated electron systems as opposed to some sort of weakly um, coupled um, description like barton cooper schrieffer theory tells us uh, in, a, in a weakly coupled picture basically what, what happens when you, when you um, have superconductivity but there are materials that are not easily explained by that. So holography might be useful here because something I didn't mention uh, is that the holography in the way that I formulated it, it works if your quantum field theory is strongly coupled. I had it on the slide, but I didn't stress it. So you, you, you have strong, strong coupling in your quantum field theory, which makes it hard to, to do anything perturbatively, get any results. Um, but then you translate it to your, to your gravity theory, and that gravity theory is weakly curved, and you can do classical gravity calculations in there. Right? So then you can translate it back to that strongly coupled quantum field theory, and you know something about it. So this is an example system where you, where you might hope that this helps because you have a strongly correlated electron system in, on your quantum field theory side. So let's translate that somehow to a gravity model. But let's, let us remind us quickly what, what, what superconductors and superfluids are and what the problem really is. Superfluids are um, systems that have a global symmetry spontaneously broken. So you formally have a U1 gauge symmetry uh, sorry, the U1 um, global symmetry. And um, this, this global symmetry is broken by um, a vacuum expectation value. Something condenses. A superconductor is basically the same thing, but it is charged. So there's the condensate that we're talking about is charged. And that comes about because the, the symmetry that you break spontaneously is not a global symmetry, but it's a local symmetry, a gauge symmetry. So there's a few caveats with, with this somewhat simplified version of a definition of superfluids and superconductors, but let's keep that as a, as a rough guideline in mind. Now, let's think back to weak coupling concepts that we have in order to describe <coughs> superconductors. Well, I mentioned we have um, this Bali kupo schrieffer theory. What happens there, the idea is, uh, and I'm sure each one of you has heard that, you have two electrons that pair up into Cooper pairs, and now first they were fermions, now they are bosons because they, can't, they are paired up, their spin adds up to be bosonic, and that composite particle, the Cooper pair, um, or Cooper pairs, they con can condense their bosonic, right? they, can, they can occupy the same state. That's basically what's happening. First you have a bunch of electrons that cannot sit in the same state, but now you cool down the system normally, and then you have electrons um, binding together, forming bosons, and bosons can occupy the same state. So that's basically what's happening in the, and, and there's a weak coupling description. This picture that I gave you is a weak coupling description. But if you, if you, what if your electrons 
not talk to their fellow electrons that they bind up with, but they talk to everyone. Because you are actually in a regime where, you, where they strongly couple to each other. So everyone is kind of talking to um, everyone else. Then that, then that notion of, a, of an electron really doesn't make sense because I cannot identify, I wouldn't be able to measure it. Like I cannot pinpoint this excitation over here in my system. Was that an individual electron or is that a collective excitation on like a carpet of electrons that is somehow interwoven, that are interwoven with each other? So that makes it difficult. That's what the, what's at the crux, what's the crux with the strongly coupled many body systems. That's what makes them hard to describe. But that's where also, um, and then you don't know a pairing mechanism like this Cooper pairing. Yeah, that, so, 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 but that's also where we, where we bring in holography and where we hope that we can build a superconductor. So what do we need? On, on the field theory side, I mentioned we need something like a, a temperature, so we cool down the system. We need a charge, and um, we want an, uh, only a condensate of charge carriers that breaks the symmetry spontaneously. Breaking it spontaneously means there should be no source for, the, for, the, for this operator. So that's what spontaneous symmetry breaking means. Basically, you have, you have that term, but you don't have that term. That's a way to, to say it holographically. And that brings us already to the gravity dual. What do we need to incorporate in our gravity theory? Well, if we have a, maybe I can do that as a test ball, now we've seen it. But what do we need in order to get finite temperature? I told you, right? You guys know. What do we need on the gravity side? What do I need to put into my empty ADS space? A black hole. Thank you. <coughs> so, what do I need in order um, to have a conserved charge that then maybe can condense? Charge. You charge the black hole, yes. So, and then in order to have no source, you want no leading order mode. So, in this expansion, in this near boundary expansion that I've been showing, you want that leading order mode to vanish. So, you're looking for particular solutions to your equations of motion in anti visitor space for your fields. Namely those for which this leading order mode vanishes, for which the source term vanishes near the boundary at r equal infinity. But the, the subleading term remains. So this subleading vacuum expectation value stays. It's finite. It's a number. So that's going to tell me that I have spontaneously broken that symmetry associated with that, that bulk gauge field that I need to introduce. And to give you a picture with that, I have a horizon here, which is charged. Then up here, that's the ADS boundary. What I need is a condensate up here, um, sitting outside of the, the horizon. Because what I want is for my, let's take my, my charge carrier here, um, sitting in the, this condensate outside the horizon. Um, I want, want it to, to be balanced and freely movable and uh, the way that's achieved is you need gravity pulling it into the horizon because there's a black hole, right? It's pulling in this, this charge because the charge also has a mass. But then the horizon is equally charged like, the, like, the char uh, like this, this little probe charge here. So it's electromagnetically repelled. And now this would be a very unstable or a metastable point, right? If, if this, this uh, probe would fluctuate just up or down a little bit, then it would either fall into the black hole or just blow off to infinity. The way that is prevented in here is that you have um, actually curvature. So the curvature generates a well, a, a potential well. Um, so gravity helps you with keeping, keeping these charges out, out there outside the horizon. And why, why these charges should be out sitting outside the horizon is, prob um, is, is going to be addressed in Christian Jensen's lectures, I believe. So because the horizon will be associated with dissipation, but for superconductors, you want no, no dissipation, you want um, charges that are freely movable. And that's what you can achieve if you get the charges out of the black, um, um, black hole horizon in somewhat in empty space where they don't hit anything. Basically, that's the idea, the picture. Now the question is, is this stable? Well, if you do the calculations, you can find that this is actually stable. Um, recall that this is the correspondence between, between this, it's basically what I've said earlier, the, you get the VEF here. In the subleading terms, you get the source in the leading order terms. Now, this picture that I just showed, just to relate it to the previous picture, it's, it's zooming into this previous picture like this. Right? So the horizon I just showed as a flat piece of the horizon. 
in the boundary, I can also show it as a flat P set. So this is, this is the way these are, pictures are related. Um, if I look only at the time component of this gauge field, the leading order term will be the chemical potential, the subleading order term will be the charge. So this is what we talked about earlier. So this is the model that I'm building. But now I, I need, need something else. I need something that, uh, that doesn't have this, this, this leading order term. And this, so this is where, where this model um, deviates from what I've, I've, I've shown before. I need another structure. And that, that is actually um, done by choosing non-abelian uh, fields. So sorry, I should um, go here. So this field, or this A mu to be better, um, to be more accurate, this gauge field needs to be non-abelian. So in addition to, to having this, this space-time index, it needs to have a, a gauge in, uh, index, so like a, um, an A. And then you have different um, gauge field components in different, different, different directions, flavor directions, if you want to call them that way. And, and then, then you can make this, this mechanism working, where you, where you have another component, not the AT component, but the spatial component, that will have a vanishing source, but, uh, but a, a VEF that will break the symmetry spontaneously. And if you want that in pictures, what I just said, in pictures that means you introduce seven seven strings. So these are the seven brains which stretch from the horizon to the boundary. And then um, on them there's um, strings that stretch between two of these seven seven, these, these seven uh, brains. So the string goes from one D7 brain to another D7 brain. And um, so these are freely movable and satisfy all the, the, prop, um, the properties that I asked of this probe. Here. And so these are actually my stringy Cooper pairs, so to say, in this, in this model. And this is really just to give you, give you a picture that hopefully will be filled with more background later on. Good. Let me um, give you some example that, that uh, will be related to Kristen Jensen's lectures. Chiral hydrodynamics. Chiral hydrodynamics um, has been developed over the past 10 years or so. And it, was ba it is basically this effect. You have, you have a bucket of chiral matter, like left-handed and right-handed fermions. And you have a magnetic field that is going through that bucket of left-handed and right-handed um, particles. Then what will happen is a, a current is generating, like such, is, is generated that separates the left-handed from the right-handed particles. Left-handed from the right-handed particles. And that ends up in, in, in being an axial current because left-handed charges move one way, right-handed charges move the other. That's like electrons moving one way, positrons moving the other. So as a net effect, the, these two effects add up to one current, right? So or it's, it's like electrons moving one way, poles moving the other way. That's another way of saying it. Right? So this, these are all analogies to this. And, and it forms um, the left handed going up, the right handed going down forms a current, chiral current. Now, this, is, this was a nice, nice derivation, um, but this seems to be confirmed in experiment, namely in so called wild semi metals. So this turns into reality now. I mean, we believe all along this has to be true, has to be true, because it's, if you believe in quantum field theory and in effective field theory, then this has to be true. But you, are, you, you want experimental proof as a physicist, so these people um, are starting to, to gain, to gather some proof, uh, because they, they use these vile semi-metals in order to create the situation where this effect is happening. Um, and and um, they, they find they, they actually find this transport effect. They find this, this kind of power current they claim. There's still some debate on that. Like, can it not be something else and so on? But yeah, this this is just uh, this as you see. This has been developing over the past year. So this is an interest an interesting story to follow at the moment. Good. So let me give you a little bit of the background. So the left side. I don't I don't want to talk about experiments. Um, I just, uh, I, in this case, I, I want to, to, to give you the, 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 the background. Thermodynamics is um, a theory that's described by, uh, well, you could look at a bunch of particles, but that's not economical. So you basically sum over the volume of your space and, and then say, well, assign these quantities, the temperature, the chemical potential, and maybe the fluid velocity. Hydrodynamics, on the other hand side, is defined locally. So you define basically the same thermodynamic quantities, but you define them 
locally at each of the different points. So this cup of coffee is in equilibrium, this cup of coffee is perturbed. And it, in some regions it's perturbed just slightly. That's where you can, will be able to do hydrodynamics, out here where the ripples are dying down. But then there's also, there's also very turbulent, very, very disruptive and very violent um, um, perturbations of this equilibrium where you have even the fluid breaking here, right? So these will be not, or classic, uh, in, in, the, in the traditional point of view, this, this will not be able to, we will not be able to model by hydrodynamics. So just to give you an idea where hydrodynamics applies. Now, this, this caveat of, of being able to um, apply hydrodynamics, um, you can formulate that as you need small gradients. So your dmu's, your gradients of your temperature, chemical potential, and um, velocity field needs to be small. So between two neighboring volume elements, they cannot have too, too large of a temperature difference. That's basically what it means to have a small gradient, right? Small, small gradients in a Fourier decomposition will translate into small frequencies, small, a small momenta, compared to the temperature. So, you can, it turns out you can basically do um, this, you can perturb the surface of a black hole. That's what in the end tur turns into fluid gravity. This is what uh, Christian Jensen is going to talk about tomorrow. And this is also where, where this effect uh, for um, vorticity was found. So you, I showed you this magnetic effect, like this chiral effect, when you, you, you have your magnetic fields and you have left-handed, right-handed particles and they're separated. Also, if you spin that bucket, if you give it a non-zero vorticity, the same thing happens, left-handed and right-handed are separated. And that's, that's what we did here. Um, but again, this is what, what Kristen is going to talk about tomorrow, so I'm not going to even mention this because I'm out of time. Um, Roshan actually yesterday, to move on to the next example, gave us another example, namely you can compute quasi-normal modes, like these guys, eigen modes, but they have complex values, so that's why they're called quasi-normal modes, quasi-eigen modes. And um, as Roshan told us yesterday, they are related to the, to the poles of correlation functions, such as, for example, the TXY, TXY correlation function, TXY being the energy momentum tensor X and Y component, the, the shear component of the energy momentum tensor in your quantum field theory. And that can be achieved from fluctuations of the metric perturbation in X, Y direction. So you perturb the metric in X, Y direction and then you can get these two point functions from the, uh, for, the, for the corresponding energy momentum tensor. One thing to point out, hydrodynamics that I showed previously is, is valid in this diagram in this area. So the nice thing about this kind of method, using the, like working on quasi-normal modes and computing two-point functions in, in holography, it takes you far beyond the validity of hydrodynamics. Right? It gives you much more, um, like more answers. Questions? Yes. The, so back to saying that the momentum has to be less than uh, the much less than the temperature. So do these poles, does something break down as... Yes, in yeah, hydrodynamics as an effective description breaks down. Yeah. If you, so I didn't, I didn't show what these omegas are. These omegas indeed um, are, I think they are plotted as, as, most of the time they're plotted as 1 over t, as in, so in frequency divided by time, uh, temperature. So 1 would be roughly where, the, where this description should, should break down. So the, the omega equal 1. Uh, radius around uh, the zero, uh, the origin would be more or less where the hydrodynamic description is, is supposed to break down because you have large gradients. There's other things that are going on under the name of resurgence or resummations of hydrodynamics and adding the non perturbative contributions to hydrodynamics and you turn it into, into from a you turn it into something that, that, that uh, converges that way and and, and you can figure out more information about it, but that's a different story. So this is this is going too far off, off track. But but yeah, traditionally just hydrodynamics is we, we don't we only trust it around here because your your frequency needs to be much smaller than your temperature, and your quasi-normal mode frequencies are already lying outside. Most of them are already lying outside that that region of validity. I guess what I'm asking is, does this quasi-normal mode procedure? Fail at some 
And when you're very far from equilibrium, this is where this procedure is not invalid. Okay, so so quasi normal modes by definition you you're solving linearized fluctuation equations. That's something that uh, Roshan told us yesterday. So if you're perturbing your fluid, not perturbing it anymore with small fluctuations, but you you violently stirring it, then you are in the middle of next week. That's exactly what people are interested in doing right now: time dependent and spatially dependent violent perturbations of space uh, of of plasmas, for example. Um, which translates on the gravity side into violent, time-dependent, and spatially-dependent um, perturbations of, or disruptions, or, yeah, I don't know, I don't know, it's not small, so it's, yeah. I don't want to call it a perturbation, but changes in, in, in um, dynamics of, of space-time. So that's, that's exactly, you're ex exactly pointing out what the, what, um, what the interesting question is here, right now, in this, in this year. Okay, so I don't want to flash through um, any of the other stuff. This is stuff that, uh, that the lecturers will cover. Um, let me just make the, the connection to this, since you asked about it. Um, the first lecture by, by Wilke uh, van der Schee on, on Monday, he will talk about exactly that, far from equilibrium, what happens there. This is a cartoon of the energy density. This is, this is the time direction. This is the spatial direction. You can imagine this as the initial time the final time, and so in the initial time you have these two guys approaching each other, like energy lumps, because this is energy in some units, so they approach each other, then they kind of go through, but not quite, they kind of stick to each other still, and drag something out behind them, and that's the quark gluon plasma, and then there's some sort of remnants also flying out. So this is the mo a cartoon, it's a, a model, or a um, yeah, a realization, a holographic realization of a heavy ion collision. And that's, uh, that's what uh, these people have invented. I just described this picture, but to give you the, the idea again, the, the, the standard um, the idea is you, you want to thermalize your quantum field theory in some way that takes some time. Once you have a thermal quantum field theory in equilibrium, you can assign a temperature. Now, what does that correspond to? I said the temperature, you need a black hole. Now, how do you get the black hole? Through black hole formation, horizon formation. And so, basically, you're asking, let's say I throw stuff into, into my empty ADF space, what happens? How long does it take in order for that stuff to form a black hole? How does it form a black hole? If I throw the stuff in in different ways, will it always say form the same kind of black hole? Those are all good questions and there's this interesting and that's what we're going to hear about next week. Um, uh, this is I already told you this in, in the colloquium so I, I won't I won't get into this I think. Um, but let me just summarize uh, what the idea here was just to expose you to some of the concepts and ideas of holography, give you some examples. These were the examples and um, instead of, of reviewing all of this, uh, now it, uh, they, maybe it's useful for you to take to go through the lectures and then, then take a look at this again afterwards and look at the references. All of these links can be clicked on so you can look at actual papers. If you have a, a particular area of application that you're particularly interested in, those papers and those references lead you further to further information there. Yeah. Um, Questions, so, yes. Yeah. So like when you when you do the perturbation, like if you give enough enough perturbation, do you, does it also take care of pair pair creation and annihilation in a system? Uh, because we are talking about condensed like a bosonic condensed state, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like does it also handle particle pair creation? Oh like pair creation. Um, that's that's yeah, so you can you it's a it's a relativistic field theory, so it, will, it, will, it has that. You, you, you have that possibility. So, for example, what the people um, were interested in is, is um, pair creation for the purpose of, like, I, um, like understanding Einstein Rosen bridges, or like even, even just um, the, the, the pair created um, entanglement. That's, that's what people also started studying with holographic models. And, and so, so um, but, but the, the most easy thing is, yeah, what, what people, you, you put in, um, an electric field into your field theory and then you look at 
how are particles, like what Schwinger sh pair creation, how are particles created in that electric field. And you can, you can do that holographically. So it's basically just, it requires you to, to, to have your, your theory, um, it, you have to allow a, a Maxwell term basically. That's more or less what, what, it, what it takes. And then you, you put in a constant background electric field, you make it strong enough, and you will see pair creation. And that corresponds to certain solutions in the bulk. Uh, and one last thing. Uh, so wh why do we need just the ADS? Can you do with the dissident space? Ah, you should ask Crystal about that. Do you want to comment on that? Well, what you need is kind of um, ADS. For many purposes, it's like a box. And you can talk about boundary. This is where you find the quantum field theory in a sense. Mm -hmm. The digital space is very similar. It also has, a, in a sense, a boundary. Mm -hmm. But it is a space-like boundary, so we don't get the time duration within the boundary. Well, that just makes it harder to describe physically interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't so we have a boundary on the time, time, along yeah. the time. The boundary of AES is timeline. Mm -hmm. You can basically view it as Minkowski space. Huh. On the Zitter, you get something like the Euclidean space as boundary theory. Yeah. And that's something which is very interesting to read the Holographic dictionary backwards and understand maybe quantum gravity on the Zitto space from quantum field theory methods. But in terms of this direction of applications, it's just not as good. The other point is you don't get uh, solutions involving the Zitto space as easily from string theory. Uh, so that's a very practical uh, problem. For most of these pairs of dualities, when you have like any for supermoons on one side, some string theory on another, you actually go through the string theory construction, you find solutions, and you show, you argue that the two sides are equivalent. Mm -hmm. If you don't find good solutions, it's harder to derive actual concrete pairs of duality. Oh, okay. So principally it can be done with just my applications. There, there is, there are studies of, of what's called DSC. They don't go directly uh, through string theory. You're kind of setting your, you're looking at their size thing. That's, I would say, not the. Okay, thank you for the comments. Um, I didn't do a very good job staying on time. Do more questions? Do we, so, yeah. do we always approach this uh, correspondence from the gravity side? Or there's some situation that you have a, uh, you can start from the quantum field theory and then you. you Look at the, but, the gravity side. That's a very good question because um, I think that was going by the name buzzword um, emergent gravity to some extent. You try to reconstruct um, ADS space from field, a field theory. Mm -hmm. So basically, you you somehow you you generate a quantum field theory with degrees of freedom, which then you get to interact in such a way to cons and then uh, look at the theory again in, in a different angle and see. Oh, there's like objects in there that satisfy Einstein's equations, and, and if you look at in them into a particular limit, it looks like an, an anti-Zitter space. So you try to generate metrics like that, and there's ideas of doing that with, with um, what, what's the tensor tensor ma um, networks. There's, there's there's different different approaches there um, that try that. Brian Swingle is one name that you might want to look up, or Sang Sik Lee has thought about this. You have other names, references to throw. Yeah, that would have another problem. So one, of, one of the very, very general things you can you can try to do is you can ask what happens if I form a black hole in ADS and it evaporates. Do I preserve information or not? <laughs> one of the things which you could argue here is you can basically describe the whole process using any for for superhighways. Maybe you don't know how exactly, but you know that this is your theoretical framework. And because for superhumans by itself is a unitary theory, so you start with the field state, you end in the field state, and preserve information, it's all good. That's something which is being debated and discussed a lot, but this is one, one direction. Okay, let's let's have a short break. Um, and